Have you ever seen a Christmas movie? Do you think they're bad, repetitive, excruciatingly simplistic? You think you're too goth for that? Well, I'm here to prove to you that a Christmas movie can, in fact, have all kinds of interesting, dark, slimy tentacles lurking beneath its surface. There is no better example than the Vanessaverse. The Vanessaverse, as I am defining it, contains eight movies, A Christmas Prince, A Christmas Prince 2, The Royal Wedding, The Princess Switch, The Night Before Christmas, A Christmas Prince 3, The Royal Baby, The Princess Switch 2, Switched Again, A Castle for Christmas, and The Princess Switch 3, Romancing the Star. Some people might prefer to call this cinematic universe the Netflix Christmas movie cinematic universe or something like that. I don't like you, Netflix. I don't like your stupid autoplaying trailers. I'm not giving you credit for this masterpiece. What these movies are most importantly characterized by and what I think should define the cinematic universe is the presence of Vanessa Hudgens. I'm pretty sure I originally jumped on the Vanessaverse bandwagon in like 2019. I know that I waited for some of these movies to come out. I was I was excited for the Vanessas to return to me again every holiday season. That being said, I did watch like five of these in one sitting and I think it melted my brain a little bit. I, I thought I liked these movies, but I think it made me hate these movies a little bit. Uh, so I don't recommend that as a method of consumption. But before we delve into the deep dark secrets of the Vanessaverse, I need to tell you a little bit about this video sponsor, Helix. Helix makes premium mattresses and bedding perfectly suited to your unique needs. The first step is filling out their sleep quiz. Everybody's different and Helix takes that into account. The sleep quiz will match your body type and sleep preferences to your perfect mattress. You can tell them a little bit about yourself, like what positions you sleep in and what kinds of concerns you have about back pain or comfort. You can fill out all of this information for your partner as well so that Helix can come up with the perfect compromise for the two of you. You can personalize your mattress even more by adding the Glacier Tex cooling cover, which is a great way to prevent overheating and protect your mattress. Helix matched me with their Twilight Luxe mattress, which is their firmest mattress. I generally prefer a firmer one because my spine has demons in it. If I sleep in a weird position or like on a bad surface, my spine will just like break in half. It's very picky, my spine. And so far, the Helix Twilight Luxe is treating it very well. I've been sleeping on it for a few months now and it's been great. My previous mattress was a lot softer and not very good for my back. So I've definitely noticed an improvement. I would confidently rate my Helix Twilight Luxe a 10 out of 10. And my little creatures probably rate it even higher because boy, do they love to sleep. When you order your Helix mattress, it will be very conveniently shipped straight to your door. It comes in a compact box and then expands once you unwrap it. Just make sure you are smarter than me and actually read the instructions before you try it. Despite that initial little excitement, everyth everything's been great since then. When you get a Helix sleep mattress, you'll get a 100 night sleep trial. You can sleep on it for exactly 100 nights, just to make sure that you really do love it. And if you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. It also comes with a 10 year warranty and there are financing options and flexible payment plans. I really like my Helix mattress and with all of the different personalized options they have, I'm sure you would really like one too. So if you're in the market for a mattress, go make sure you check out Helix. Go to helixsleep.com slash Link below to get $200 off your mattress as well as two free pillows. The first film in the Vanessaverse is A Christmas Prince. I would say The Christmas Prince follows a lot of the expected, like, established Hallmark movie tropes. The protagonist, Amber, is an ambitious journalist from the big city with no time for romance. Richard is the prince of a fictional European country called Aldovia. His dad died one year ago and the interregnum between rulers is running out. So he's gonna have to step up and claim the throne soon. The world is on the edge of their seats because you see Richard has a bit of a reputation as like a bad boy, playboy, edgy boy type of prince who might not fulfill the royal duties because doesn't this cold expressionless mask of a face just say bad boy all over it. Amber goes to Aldovia for a press conference which Richard is holding about the succession. He ends up canceling it but our girl boss refuses to go home without a story. So she poses as Richard's sister, Emily's new American tutor to get into the palace. Amber wins Emily's trust by just like baseline not being an ableist piece of shit, which is just, oh, the bar is so low. She gains acceptance. She gains entry to the sort of royal social circle. She learns that Richard is nothing like his edgy media persona and they fall in love through various magical Christmas activities. Meanwhile though, Richard's sexy evil ex-girlfriend and his creepy cousin Simon are scheming to get the throne for themselves. Amber, who is still lying about her identity, is, is doing her journalist stuff behind the scenes, trying to find some kind of a juicy story about the royal family uh, while drinking hot cocoa with them by day. Oh, scandalous. But anyway, she discovers that Richard is in fact adopted. And instead of just openly adopting him and changing the succession laws so that he could inherit the throne when his parents died, they just like 
didn't do that. Like, this man is, like, 35 years old. They had so much time to make sure this wasn't going to be a problem. But they just didn't do that. Simon and Richard's ex think there's something suspicious about Amber, so they break into her room, find all of the information that she found about Richard, and then dramatically reveal the truth about Richard and about Amber's true identity, and claim the throne for themselves. They are now married, by the way. I think they met, like, three days ago, but they are now married. So Amber needs to decipher this, like, cryptic Christmas poem left by the dead king, which leads her to a secret compartment in a Christmas ornament containing the documents that change the succession laws so that Richard can become king. Cool plot, guys. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. She saves the day, but still feels terrible about having deceived Richard about her identity, so she gets on a plane and flies back to New York immediately after the coronation. On New Year's, she is being sad and lonely in her dad's restaurant, but Richard shows up outside, and they kiss, and he proposes to her, and her dad just stares at them. For too long. Nobody, nobody makes prolonged eye contact with their family members who are making out in the street. Sir, sir, please. A Christmas Prince too. The royal wedding. One year has passed. Amber is now very famous and popular as the queen to be of Aldovia. However, she's just still a humble girl at heart, just a humble blogger. She arrives in Aldovia to begin planning the wedding, which of course is going to happen on Christmas. She wants to spend time with Richard, but finds that he is extremely busy being, you know, the head of a country. And she finds that she is being discouraged from participating in any of the real politics of running Aldovia. The only thing she's really allowed to care about as a woman is her wedding, and even then she doesn't really have any control over it because it all has to be like in line with royal traditions. Oh no, it's almost as if you chose to marry into this extremely traditional and conservative royal family. Shocking. Also, the economy is in shambles. The princess's play gets cancelled because of a worker's strike. How unchristmassy! The people are revolting. They're like one bad week away from rolling out the guillotine, I think. This was very close to being a much more interesting movie. Richard is like moderately upset about all of this. He spends a lot of the movie just sulking around going, Boo, my economy! If only something could be done! Who's in charge of this place? I suppose we have to cheer ourselves up with cozy Christmas activities. We'll put on the princess's Christmas play at the palace. Christmas is saved! You take that worker strike! Also, Simon is back, and we're, we like him now, I think? Also, Amber's friends, who we saw her FaceTime to explain the plot a few times in the first movie, are there now in person for the wedding. They all decide it's about time. They investigate the royal finances, which they do all huddled around a singular laptop with festive beverages. Princess Emily is like a dangerous expert hacker now. So they weed out the one corrupt official responsible, and the economy is saved. Yay. Richard did not help at all, by the way. More importantly, though, the royal wedding. Because as we know, it is very important to have an extravagant royal wedding in the middle of a financial crisis. If not for Emily's hacker skills, they would all be guillotined at this point. Amber gets Richard to defend her against all the stuffy royal officials who want to curate her image, and she gets to wear besparkled converse to her wedding in the end. Yay. Now we move on to the princess switch. The first Vanessaverse movie to, in fact, star Vanessa Hudgens. She is in all of them, though, I assure you. It may not seem that way at first, but we'll get there. The Princess Switch protagonist, Stacy, is less, I think, like the Hallmark movie city girl protagonist trope. She lives in Chicago, which you can tell because she's always wearing this touristy Chicago hat. But she's more down to earth, she works in a bakery, her best friend is her hot co-worker Kevin. She's totally not into him though, ew. Even though the movie makes it very obvious that he's supposed to be like, hot and kind and talented and a good father, and just like all around grown in a lab as straight woman bait, Kevin's daughter is uncomfortably invested in them getting together. Like this kid's entire personality is being into romance and marriage and her father's dating life. It's uncomfortable. One of the weird hills that I will die on in life is that children are like an almost universally badly written demographic in media. Most children are just absolutely atrocious. They are props and they are plot devices way more often than they are actually characters. So it is certainly not unique for to have a badly written child, but it's just, it's, it just irks me. This, this irks me in a particular way. It's just so bad. <laughs> the plot begins when Stacy and Kevin are invited to compete in the annual Christmas baking competition of a fictional European country called Belgravia. The Princess Switch is interesting to me genre-wise because 
a Christmas prince. At least the first one, I think, takes a lot of tropes from Hallmark movies, but The Princess Switch discards a lot of those original Hallmark movie seeds while still taking a lot from A Christmas Prince. Fictional European country with beautiful snowy mountains like a Christmas postcard. All of the royals of these made-up countries speak English with perfect British accents. The fantasy of being a commoner falling in love with a royal. The traditional, even fairy tale romance ideals of it all. The prince character looks like this. I honestly cannot tell these men apart. Like, both of the prince men, they are the man in the tan jacket from Welcome to Night Vale, if anybody understands that reference. Like, as soon as I am no longer looking at them, I completely forget what their face look like. If you were to show me them side by side, I would have a hard time telling you which is from which movie, even though I just watched these movies. Okay, Marjorie is in The Princess Switch, Butter is in The Christmas Prince. What does that mean? Butter is, it, is the prince in... Okay, but why is he Butter? Because he's thumbier <laughs> than the other one, but both of them could be spreadable and are boring. Both of these men look spreadable. So the other guy is Marjorie because he's Kind of meltier and softer looking. We're in agreement that the princess switch one is margarine. Yes. And the Christmas prince is butter. Yes. Cool. Cheers. Anyway, considering that the princess switch borrows so much from a Christmas prince, it is only natural that it should give a nod to its predecessor. And so there is a scene in the princess switch where two characters are seen watching a Christmas prince on Netflix to get into the holiday spirit. Stacy encounters this Salvation Army coded Christmas donation collector guy, and he goes, Oh, it's Christmas, so much magic of Christmas. And she goes, Oh, if only I had someone to spend Christmas with. She will then encounter the exact same man only days later in a market in Belgravia. So I guess this guy is supposed to be like the kindly, all knowing God, Jesus, Santa Claus, magic Christmas old man watching over you trope. It's not unique, it is, it is a common Christmas movie trope. However, I think. The Vanessa, you, the Vanessa verse, the Vanessa, the ultimate Vanessa, the Vanessa verse uses it to make some interesting and even shocking implications. But I will, I will get to that once some more pieces have fallen into place. I just want to flag this as something interesting for you. In Belgravia, Stacy meets Margaret, the princess of yet another fictional European country called Montenaro. Margaret is in Belgravia to marry the Prince of Belgravia in an arranged political marriage. But why would such a thing be necessary in the world of 2018? So far we have been led to believe that the Vanessaverse movies take place in a world not so different from our own, but already the filmmakers had begun to hint that this may not be the case. Margaret is dreading being married off for political gain. She yearns to experience life as a normal girl. Stacy takes pity on her and agrees to switch identities with her, even though this means catfishing both of their loved ones for numerous days. Margaret falls in love with Kevin. Stacy falls in love with the prince. Obviously, he exudes raw sex appeal. They switch back just in time for Stacy to compete in and win the Christmas baking competition. But rather than leave their love interests, confused and heartbroken over these random complete personality changes in their respective Vanessa Hudgenses. Margaret emerges with the prince to present the award to the winner of the baking competition on behalf of the Belgravian royalty or something, thus revealing that she and Stacy are in fact identical and providing a situation to explain. You would think there would be a better situation, like, are, are you guys not on live television right now? Like, do you not also have to present the awards for the second and third place? Like, why are you having a personal conversation right now? The prince immediately proposes to Stacy. Everybody on set is just enraptured by this. Kevin and Margaret agree to continue dating. Kevin's daughter is extremely hyped. Oh my God, no one watches their family members make out. Please stop putting this in movies. XOXO. Mr. Father Strange. There's no consequences to any of this happening, despite the fact that it has just obliterated this strategic political marriage between Margaret and the prince. Everyone's just like, yay, they're in love and it's Christmas, what fun! The Night Before Christmas. This movie takes place in Bracebridge, Ohio, but was filmed in Bracebridge, Ontario, which means that it takes place in Ontario to me. One thing that is endlessly hilarious to me is the amount of movies and TV shows that are filmed in Toronto or in Ontario and passed off as the US. I know it's because it's cheaper to film here, but I just, I love it. I love it when I see the Toronto skyline in a movie with the CN Tower edited out. All of those things take place in Ontario to me. The Night Before Christmas, which takes place in Ontario, stars Vanessa Hudgens as Brooke, a small town high school teacher who just hasn't met her Prince Charming yet. Modern guys, am I right? Dating in this stressful, fast-paced society 
with phones? If only she could find someone a little romantic and old-fashioned, by which we mean literally someone from the 14th century. Delightful and festively themed time travel antics ensue. Cole jumps in front of her car because uh, he doesn't know what a car is. <laughs> Wacky. At the hospital, they assume he's like a medieval scholar with amnesia or brain damage or something. So they're assuming he is seriously injured. And yet, Vanessa Hudgens faces no consequences for seriously injuring this man because her dad was a cop who was friends with this cop. She is then allowed to take the injured man to her house. Oh my god, she would be such a good serial killer. Also, yes, everyone in this movie lives in a beautiful mansion perfectly decorated for Christmas, despite the fact that they are all available single parents with average jobs. Cole learns about modern human culture by watching a lot of TV, including two other Netflix Christmas movies, A Holiday in the Wild and Holiday Calendar. By the end of the movie, Cole realizes that his quest all along. His purpose being sent to the future was to fall in love with Vanessa Hudgens. He also apparently now has the ability to travel between their two worlds at will, but Vanessa Hudgens thinks he's gone forever and love is a lie, but he comes back to be with her and it's so romantic and then he presumably sticks around in, in 2019 to become a small town cop with a massive sword. Because if you haven't heard, cops are good in basically modern nights. Merry Christmas everyone! Let's just parse this out for a second, okay? So Cole is transported to 2019 by a cryptic magical forest lady officially called the Crone. The Princess Switch featured this like, kind of like wink and smile, might be an all-knowing God, Jesus, Santa Claus figure guy watching over you, okay? But the night before Christmas introduces a much more interesting possibility. The Crone is not just watching over, she is very much the orchestrator of these characters' destinies. Oh, your soulmate isn't going to be born for another 500 years? That's not a problem for her. These characters are just being puppeted around by all-powerful gods who have chosen their destinies for them and will make them happen via whatever space-time bending antics are necessary. I would go as far as to say the powers that these gods have might not even be limited to just time travel. They're probably able to reach between worlds because the 14th century that Cole comes from is not real. It's not historical. You're telling me this man respects women and bathes? He's a fantasy storybook knight, not a real one. Perhaps that is what the crone brought into the reality of 2019 to fulfill Brooke's fantasies. The rules of this world are weird and never fully made explicit, so I'm just, I'm just spitballing here. And it's important stuff, because the rules that apply to the world of A Night Before Christmas also apply to the Christmas Prince. They canonically take place in the same universe. There's a scene where Brooke's sister is showing her daughter an acorn Christmas ornament, just like the one from The Christmas Prince, and she mentions that it is in fact from Aldovia. A Christmas Prince 3, the royal baby. I love heterosexual romance story. It is yet again Christmas in Aldovia, and Amber is pregnant with the royal baby. One of Amber's friends is there because she is now dating Simon, who might be evil again. Her other friend is also there because he is business partners with the eccentric wedding designer from the last movie. Business part- business partners. Partners in business just to aggressively queer-coded business partners. Standing five feet apart because they're not gay. We get into some serious serious world building in this movie, okay? So there's this treaty that was signed on Christmas Eve in the year 1419, exactly 600 years ago, between Aldovia and another fictional country called Panglia. This treaty ended a war and the countries have since been great allies. Therefore, they ritually re-signed the treaty every 100th anniversary. So this Christmas Eve in 2019 is the exact 600 year anniversary of the original signing of the treaty. So they gotta sign it again, just so we know that the audience is able to handle all of this information. There is a very helpful history lesson in which they show this map, which features Aldovia, Penglia, Belgravia from the Princess Switch. No Montenero though, maybe it's just cut off or something. And the longer you look at this map, the, the weirder it gets, because it becomes clear that we are dealing with an entirely different historical timeline from our own. Aldovia, Penglia, and Belgravia are all very large countries for Europe. They encompass the territory of a number of real countries each, completely eradicating or changing the histories of all of those countries. I am no history expert myself, 
but I have found posts online from people talking about all of the historical points that this implies never happened or happened very differently. Obviously the monarchies of Eldovia and Belgravia are British, and the monarchy of Penglia is East Asian, which implies completely different powers that were fighting and conquering in these areas than did in our own history. How far back does the historical record differ from our own? What happened to the Ottoman Empire? Vanessa Hudgens! I mean, I guess this is this is definitely an explanation for why the absolute power of monarchies seems to still be a thing in some parts of Europe. Why these rituals and 600-year-old treaties and political marriages are of grave importance still in 2019. What a fascinating choice of these filmmakers to, to tell us this story, to let us glimpse this alternate world mainly through inane Christmas festivities. Because underneath this shiny royal facade, this world is barely holding itself together, I think. It's run by idiots. I mean, we saw Richard's attitude towards leading his country into economic ruin, but the story is told with them as unquestionable heroes. These are fluffy movies about falling in love on Christmas. But really, <laughs> love and Christmas are lies, and the ruling class creates such propaganda. So the king and queen of Penglia arrive in Aldovia. Amber is on her usual girl bossing and tries to convince the queen of Penglia that they should be the first ever queens to sign the treaty alongside their husbands, but the queen of Penglia is kind of iffy on defying tradition and gender and all of that. Then they discover that the treaty has actually been stolen. Thankfully, a giant blizzard traps everyone in the palace so they have time to weed out the thief. Emily discovers that there's a legend continues to be the only useful character, she discovers that there's this legend that, like, a curse will fall upon the firstborn child of the monarchs to break the treaty, and everyone is like, a curse? We don't, we don't really believe in curses? I mean, it is 2019, so it, a curse? But, like, no one can come up with a better reason for why there should be horrible consequences to them breaking the treaty, so they just keep repeating the curse thing, and then everyone going, but we don't believe in curses, though. Of course it is very dire matter, and we must find the treaty before Christmas Eve, but it's not the curse! There's no curse! You know what's a good idea? Let's have a baby shower! Various investigative shenanigans ensue, you know, it's probably Simon. You know, he's got- I know we forgave him in the last movie, but look at him, he's just got his villainous little face, I bet it was him. Amber starts going into labor, and it's already Christmas Eve, and we only have a few hours before the curse! <laughs> it is totally the curse, by the way, the curse is real. The crone is gonna show up and steal your baby and send it to the High School Musical universe to grow up to be hip-hop girl. I love to pop and lock and jam and break. Is that even legal? And the culprit who stole the treaty turns out to be this guy. Who is this guy? Who, literally, who is this guy? Apparently a descendant of someone who had beef with one of the original princes who signed the treaty, whatever, we don't care. Amber gives birth on Christmas Day. That movie came out three years ago now, and I'm still waiting. I still have not given up on The Christmas Prince 4, The Royal Divorce. The Princess Switch 2 switched again. Stacy and Prince Boy are still together because proposing after knowing someone for like one week always goes very well. Margaret and Kevin, who were probably having intercourse out of wedlock or something, they broke up six months ago. Nobody is more upset about this than Kevin's daughter, obviously. Then somebody dies and Margaret has to take over the throne of Montanaro. She is to be crowned queen on Christmas. Everything important that happens in these countries seems to happen on Christmas. I am starting to find it unlikely that they are able to shove every important life event onto Christmas onto one day of the year. Weddings, coronations, treaty signings, births. It's just unlikely that they did all of that on Christmas. That is, if there is only one Christmas. Because I propose that the calendar used in this alternate history is made up of 12 months, like ours, except all of those months are December, thus suspending this world in a hellish perpetual state of Christmas. We only perceive these movies as Christmas movies because Christmas is just something that comes once a year for us, but this is what they're like all the time. Christmas takes up way too much of their identities for me to believe otherwise. Stacy, Prince Boy, and the daughter scheme to invite Kevin to Margaret's Christmas coronation so that they can fall back in love, and they do. But you see, not all is well, because there is a third Vanessa Hudgens on the loose, cousin Fiona. Just imagine the same kind of questionable British accent that she does as the Margaret character, but with like a veneer of 
cartoonish horniness. Meow. Meow to you as well. Fiona and her hench people scheme to steal the crown by kidnapping Margaret and having Fiona switch places with her and get crowned instead. Is this a plan that would work out in the long term? No, but I think the plan was more along the lines of uh, get crowned, get access to stuff long enough to drain the royal bank accounts and flee the country, and like somebody can like find Margaret in a ditch after that. So obviously a great plan. No plot holes here whatsoever. Little do they know though that Margaret and Stacy have already switched places at this point because Margaret needed some time to escape from her royal duties and be with Kevin. So she already switched. This is the switch movie. They have to, they, they switch. That's like the whole movie. So the villains are foiled, but Kevin has already gone to the airport to leave the country dramatically. They all run there to stop him. And thankfully, who is in the airport but a priest who is just literally just minding his own business, trying to have a coffee before his flight. They bother him until he agrees to marry Stacy. No. Margaret and Kev, yes until he agrees to marry Margaret and Kevin on the spot in the airport. Margaret is then crowned queen and in attendance in the celebrations audience are Amber, Richard, and the royal baby. Therefore putting the princess switch in the same universe as a Christmas prince and also the night before Christmas, adding a fourth Vanessa Hudgens to this canon. Our next film is probably the biggest outlier on this list. It's A Castle for Christmas. It follows Sophie Brown, a very rich and successful, like trashy romance novel writer. She gets divorced and copes with this by killing off the beloved love interest character in her books, who was based on her ex-husband, causing her entire fan base to turn against her. So she decides to run off to hide in Scotland for a little while. This leads her to deciding to buy a castle where her grandfather once worked as a groundskeeper, even though this place is like a horribly maintained death trap. I think this woman might be having some kind of a crisis, but that's okay, because it's Christmas. And also she has unlimited money, so she, whatever. She has to become roommates with the asshole duke that she's buying the castle from for reasons. And naturally they fall in love over the magic of Christmas. Two of the characters from the princess switch, Frank and Mrs. Donatelli are in it for like two seconds. We see them check into the same hotel that Sophie is staying at, putting a castle for Christmas in the same universe as the rest of the Vanessaverse movies. I think this was done to highlight how unique Aldovia, Belgravia, Montenero, and Panglia are in their own universe. They have these highly conservative and traditional Christmas-based societies. But Scotland, on the other hand, is it, it's Scotland. Something that the movie A Castle for Christmas goes into is that there are thousands of castles in Scotland and they go up for sale regularly. Families which pass them down for hundreds of years are giving them up now because they're so much work and they're not practical to have in a modern world where it really doesn't matter that much that your ancestors were nobles or royals or whatever. The existence of at least four new European countries and the non-existence of many more. You would think would have far-reaching consequences for, for a lot of European history. But whatever theories we develop about what is going on in the Vanessaverse need to account for Scotland just being regular Scotland. Fuck these movies. Oh my god. The Princess Switch 3, Romancing the Star. This movie is uh, the least watchable Vanessaverse movie, in my humble opinion. It just blatantly rips off the important relic stolen plot of A Christmas Prince 3. But really the heart and soul of the movie in the end is Fiona's deep-seated mommy issues. It honestly feels like we see very little of Stacy and Margaret in this movie. And when we do, they're pretending to be Fiona because this is the princess switch and they have to switch. I'm starting to forget what Vanessa Hudgens' actual voice sounds like. Please help me. This movie even further solidifies the connection to a Christmas prince. Simon is there at a party for like two seconds and it's implied that he knows Fiona through their shared hobby of crime. There's a reference to Penglia's existence at one point. There is a much more troubling aspect though of the world building of this film. As punishment for her crimes of the last film, Fiona is doing community service at a convent. The stolen important artifact is the special Christmas star fucking whatever is on loan to Montanero from the Vatican. We see Margaret having meetings with a cardinal about this. That's right, the most disturbing possible twist. 
Catholics! Up until this point, Christmas in the, these universes has felt like a completely secular affair. Christmas trees and presents and hot chocolate and, and none of that Jesus stuff, though. You are telling me that Montanaro apparently has very close ties with the church? They have a convent in a castle surrounded by water with nuns wearing the full traditional habit where they send disgraced royals instead of jail? Cool! Actually, you know, it is pretty cool. I would commit crimes if I got to go there. How much control do we think the church has over their government and legal system? Vanessa? Actually, there was, there was that priest who married Margaret and Kevin in The Princess Witch 2 in the airport. Like, there was no legal documentation. There was, there was like nothing else necessary. He just has the power to do that. The church is all powerful. Of course they would be in this completely Christmas-based society. And what's so sinister? is that it's subtle. There's no overt religious imagery in any of these films. But when I think about the gender roles, the obsession with traditional marriage, the whole morality of these films, oh, it just keeps getting more and more depraved. I had been characterizing the gods, obviously, at play in this universe as like a little more pagan, a little spicier. But is that not the case? Are you telling me this is what the Catholic God looks like? I wish so badly to understand the workings of the, the Vanessa-verse, but it is always just out of my reach. And then there's the problem of A Christmas Prince existing as a movie in The Princess Switch, which takes place in the same universe as A Christmas Prince, making it a movie in its own universe. But then of course, if there is a multiverse, it's possible that these movies do not show us a glimpse into one consistent alternate universe, but various slightly differing alternate universes. One version of Stacy may attend the same coronation party as characters from A Christmas Prince, and one may watch A Christmas Prince on television. However, films appearing within films this is not nearly the only instance of it. A Christmas Prince appears in The Princess Switch, even though they take place in the same universe. Two other Christmas movies produced by Netflix, Holiday in the Wild and Holiday Calendar, appear in A Night Before Christmas. Holiday Calendar appears in another one called Christmas Inheritance. Christmas Inheritance then appears in Holiday Calendar and The Princess Switch. Why not then could every Vanessaverse movie also exist within itself. One Vanessa Hudgens may sit down with another Vanessa Hudgens with a glass of cozy hot cocoa and watch three more Vanessa Hudgenses grace their screen. Don't you see? It's infinite Vanessa Hudgenses all the way down. Our very definitions of reality and existence are useless in the face of Vanessa Hudgens. Is it all nothing but a fractured dream in the mind of one godlike Vanessa Hudgens, or a horrible side effect to the tears in reality created by the time travel experiments of genius scientist Gabriela Montez. Your guess is as good as mine. I hope you're feeling festive, kids. I will not see you again, actually, I don't think, until the new year. And just like Vanessa Hudgens, I hope you are having a terrifying eldritch horror of a holiday season.